Um, I think it's time to start. Maybe some uh, Spanish people will get you late, but we um, have to deal with that. Uh, my name is Anna, and I'm the scientific coordinator of the Spanish Embassy. And uh, I would just like to say hello to everybody and welcome to the Spanish Embassy. And uh, then I give the floor to Susana to introduce our uh, speaker tonight. It's a very uh, big pleasure. She is the coordinator of education and outreach in the Science Association, the Scientific uh, Science Association in the USA. Um, and they are doing a lot of things with us, and uh, we are so proud of that, and hope you will uh, enjoy it today, and hope you have a lot of questions afterwards. Okay? Susanna Chavez left. <laughs> 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 I hope so. Oh, I'll explain what we're doing. I forgot my Sorry. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, my name is Anna Marquez, and I'm a coordinator of the Education and Outreach Program of the Spanish scientists in the US, and in the name of the president in the Cuba, and other members of the board are going to go to this event. I'm going to speak very, very briefly about the PUSA, but I think that I'm going to my person for the previous our speaker. Um, the PUSA started in Lugia, in this circle, a year ago, with a small group of scientists, and since that, we have grown a lot. We already have 365 members, one member per year, we start exactly last March in 2014. We already have two chapters, one in Boston, one in New York, and the most recent in Washington, D.C. Um, the Washington, D.C. chapter started very recently. We have members of the chapter here. The same is Ana Muñoz. And I would encourage anybody that is interested in joining the PUSA, D.C. to talk to the other staff. PUSA has three objectives, three objectives. One of them is part of the outreach program and include to bring the science to the public. And this series of seminars that we are organizing here is part of that part of the program. The other project is one is networking, provide opportunities for communication and meeting Spanish scientists in here. And the other also is provide the welcoming to newcomers. And the other Objective well, is establish interaction with institutions here in the US and also in Spain, or public and private. Um, but this program of education outreach, we have started a series of seminars um, in 2015 in our three chapters in Boston, in New York, and in Washington. Uh, in Washington, this is our third talk. Uh, these seminars are sponsored by the Foundation Ramona Vertes. The Pride Foundation in Spain and also have the Spanish Foundation of Science and Technology that Anna is a member here in the embassy. Uh, so these are provided with the responsibility of the seminars. Here is the list of seminars that we have for the spring series. Today we have Carmen Ravena, Carmen Ravena, and then we have three more for April, May, and June. And in the fall, we have more seminars that we have in the ultimate uh, stocks. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Carmen Reina. Um, Carmen is the senior scientist with the Global Marine Team at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, she holds degrees in zoology and conservation biology from the University of Computers in Madrid and the University of Maryland. Uh, she has been involved in multiple global assessments, including the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. The World Water Development, um, she has published numerous publications and has been part of the, form, the publication that was the basis for the TBS special series on other fishing. Um, with that, I want to welcome Carmen and the call of her seminar here. Working with you tonight. Thank you. Welcome everybody for this very short Spanish. I'm Spanish. I wanted to thank the embassy and Ipusa 
um, for inviting me. I just heard about the Crucial Olympic Convention, but I'm just interested in there doing a lot with raising down my network of scientists and students. And I've discovered we have all kinds of contacts at the, at the embassy that are also very involved in fisheries and agriculture. So this is great. So usually when um, <coughs> you come to listen to someone that works on the oceans, they always say they grew up next to the ocean and they spent their summers snorkeling with their parents. Well, I grew up in Madrid, which is probably the furthest you can get from the ocean in Spain. My parents hated the beach, so we never went to the beach. Instead, we spent all our holidays in the But my father is an avid angler, he likes to fly fish for trout. And he went to all the you know little rivers around Madrid and in the north and tried for me to get to fish. And I am probably the worst fisher woman on the planet. I am not good at it, I never caught anything. So I spent a lot of time on weekends just sitting by the river watching my father fish, which is as exciting as watching golf on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so all I had was books and the books that I had were my my father's fishing tanks. And I really got very interested in how many types of fish there are. And then I grew up with an American mother and grew up with Dr. Seuss, who also has a thing for fish. But I blame Dr. Seuss for my interest in fish. Um, so I continued my career in biology and conservation. Um, and I ended up, I had a nice picture of a fish because, you know, they are cute. I mean, they may not look cute, but they are cute. That's another reason. And I ended up at the Nature Conservancy, and some of you I know here, because I've seen there's some colleagues here from, from some of CNC and some from other years. But for those who don't know, the Nature Conservancy is one of the largest conservation organizations. Um, our mission is to conserve the lands and waters of the John Mark Depends. And we were founded in 1951 in the state of New York. We started as a land trust, so buying land and setting it aside for conservation. We have about 3,500 employees, 600 of them are scientists. We are known to be a science-based organization. We're in 35 countries and in all 50 states of the U.S. Uh, we have about a million members, uh, and then we saved a lot of the trees and miles of rivers. But currently, we have about 200 marine-related projects around the world. So I'm going to focus just on fish, in the country that's <laughs> Um and in addition of fish being really cute and tasty, they are fisheries are really important for, for humans. So about 70% of 17% of the world depends on fisheries as the primary source of animal protein. There are also many people that depend on fisheries and agriculture for jobs. It's around, I mean, their numbers are not exact, but they're they also cite site about 500 million jobs. And in addition, it's one of the most um, traded food commodities. Um, it generates about $130 billion a year in trade, and more than 50% of this comes from developing countries. And just to give you an example, because I am always amazed at the statistic that 90% of the seafood we eat in the U.S. is imported from somewhere else. And that's something that most consumers, I don't think, think about. So, the problem with today's way that we fish is that we're just really, really good at catching. So good at it that 85% of the stocks are either depleted, overfished, or being fished at their biological limit, which means that if you put more pressure on them, they can also be overfished. Uh, and these statistics, even though they're kind of sobering, really only refer to those fish stocks and those fisheries that we actually regularly assess, which is about 400 stocks around the world, and there are about 10,000 fisheries. All the other fisheries, we really don't monitor them and we don't really have a good sense of how they're doing. But there's a, a paper from some of the leading scientists in this area from the University of Santa Barbara. And they have shown, looking at catch statistics, that, that even these anisest fisheries, the ones that we don't know much about, are in really um, declining condition. And this is a graph of those kinds of fisheries. So you have the large scale fisheries, which are not doing that badly, but they're still in decline. And then the ones that are in real trouble are the small scale around the world. And the Nature Conservancy does work in both, but we're paying 
a lot of attention to the NSS small scale business issues. It's also in where most of the people um, have jobs or depend on. For those in the room, a lot of in the room know this by heart. <laughs> but for those of you in the room that don't know how, how did we end up in this messy situation with fisheries, is that most of the fisheries in the world are still managed under what we call the open access system, basically with very little control and regulation. So the incentive is to raise fish, to raise um, to catch fish because if you if you have short time to catch fish, you try and go out and catch as much fish as you can, as fast as you can, so you don't catch somebody else will. So that's one of the largest problems with enforcement. There's too many boats. The picture up there is in, in China and the East China Sea. This is the first day that the China Sea has been fishing again, and as you can see, it's a massive amount of boats. Um, we could catch the same amount of fish we catch today with 50% less of the boats we have. So it's, it's not a very efficient use of our fleet. Uh, the industry together uses about $50 billion a year for this management. And most of the countries and the fisheries departments just don't have the resources to really assess and manage and enforce the law. So it's part of it is that it's you know, lack of money. At the same time, we waste a lot of fish. Um, and we do a lot of damage to habitats, which also impacts fishery production. Um, one of these impacts is the bycatch, and what we call bycatch and discards. Bycatch is the, the things you catch that you're not intending to catch, but you catch anyway. And this affects a lot of species like sea turtles and seabirds or some marine mammals. And discards are things that, sorry about the timing, <laughs> I think. Things that you catch, you're not intended to catch either, and you can either not keep or you're not going to use. So that just gets thrown back in the ocean, so it's kind of wasteful. And also, we do that a lot with sharks. You cut the fins off and then just throw the carcass back in the ocean. In terms of how we fish, we've been in the northern hemisphere on fishing methods that are quite destructive. They're very technical fishing methods. So, bottom trawling is an example. They're large nets that get dragged at the bottom of the sea, and they're very effective. They catch everything that pass. So down below, this one is without a troll pass, and then that's what's left after the troll has gone by. And as you can see, it pretty much sucks everything up. But it's not a very selective way of fishing. So you catch a lot of stuff that you really don't need that ends up being tossed back in the ocean. In the developing world, um, the most useful the one that they use the most are gill nets, and it's the same thing. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to use, it's cheap, you can avoid at any time, it's very effective, it catches a lot of stuff, but again, it's not very selective. So, you catch a lot of uh, juvenile fish that haven't had time to reproduce. So, all these things combined make the situation in our fisheries to be on a declining trend. But it's not all that depressing. So, at the Nature Conservancy, of course, we want to fix the problem, and we want more fish, we want healthy oceans, we would like fishermen to continue having jobs and keeping their jobs in local communities, and we also want sustainable supply of seafood. Um, our focus is on the supply side. There are a lot of groups that have worked a lot on creating the demand, so a lot of groups have worked with Whole Foods and Costco and all these supermarkets to really <coughs> demand sustainable sourcing. Of seafood, and that's been very, um, very good. But there's not enough supply, and the Nature Conservancy really is good at working on the ground with fishermen. So we are kind of focusing on, on helping create that supply and helping move these fisheries that are data poor, that are open access to some sort of regulated system to be rights-based on or another similar. And we do this a lot by partnering with fishermen and the private sector. Also work with government, but they're a little slow. Um, a government right here. <laughs> <laughs> so where we're working now, uh, we're focusing on the five, top, one, five of the top fishing nations: the United States, uh, Indonesia, China, Peru, and Chile. But we also focus on a lot of smaller countries and small island states where fisheries are very important for the livelihood. So in Micronesia. Laos, Federal, Federal States of Micronesia, and Marshall Islands, 
Asia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Kenya, and, and the Caribbean, and the Bahamas, and the Philippines. <laughs> so that's sort of where the fishery, the PNC works with many countries, but this is where the fisheries group is focused on. And how we work, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to walk you through a couple of projects a little bit for sense, but we have this five prong approach. Um, in all of the places where we work are main partners of the fishermen. They're the ones out there fishing every day. They're the ones that have to change the fish. So we have to involve them and, and help them lead reforms. We're focusing again on these group of fishermen that are unassessed and trying to find ways that you could assess them at a lower cost so people can do it with not fancy research vessels, a lot of money, and a lot of capacity. We work with governments because we do need a policy framework. Uh, uh, we're focusing a lot on new technology and trying to use technology and the changes in technology to advance and, and fisheries management. And finally, we're working with the buyers, the distributors, and the processors that work up front in the supply chain to also help these small scale fisheries access the market and get a little bit more income from the products and the information better. So I'm going to focus on Three projects, uh, one in Pulau, one in Indonesia, that revolve around assessing the condition of fish stocks and where they're working with the data for fishery. And then I'll talk about one in Pulau. <coughs> so, on these fisheries, about 80% of the world's catch comes from these fisheries that we know very little about. And if you don't know how much fish there are, and you don't know how much pressure they're under, or how much capacity that stock has to recover, it's very hard to manage it. Basically, something doesn't get measured usually goes unmanaged. But the traditional way that stock assessments are done are very costly. They're a hundred thousand, two million dollars, they require a research vessel, they require a lot of data, and they require a lot of scientists to do the work. In most of the developing world, and including a lot of the states in Asia, don't have those resources for that capacity. So it has to be another way. And we believe that you can find um, cheaper methods that can use catch data to assess the stock so that you can set management measures that are realistic. Even though they might never be as fancy as a real stock assessment, but they're, they're something to start with. And we tend to engage fishermen and, and processors in this data collection so that they start seeing the data for themselves. And once they are the ones collecting the data, they tend to believe it more. So in Palau, and for those of you who don't know where Palau is, Palau is a small island state in the western Pacific. It's to the west of the Philippines, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's formed by about 250 volcanic islands, and it has a population, so it's not a huge country. Uh, but it's a country that really depends on the beauty of their coral reefs and their ocean resources. They, early on, they've had a, a government and a president that have been very committed to the environment. And so up to 40% of their Palauan waters are under a marine protection area type of um, regulation. So in theory, their water should be um, doing quite well, their fishery should be doing quite well. But the population of Palau, the people we talk to, the fishermen, I could say actually no. Is on the glove or the fish. Um, but of course, it's never their fault, right? So, Latinos are coming in and we go researching, or Indonesians are coming, or it's, you know, that tourism hotel and they're discharging, so it was never their fault. So, we started a program with the fishermen in the northern region of Palau to collect data on, on the fish they're catching. And they taught them how to measure the fish, the length, and how to look at the reproductive organs of the fish to see if they were. Short fish and juvenile fish. Um, so we did this to a few of the top species that these flowers uh, depend on. And we found that 60% of the fish are catching are juvenile fish. So they realized, hmm, now maybe we do have something to do with it after all. And it was amazing because after we presented the findings, they were they stopped questioning whose fault it was. They said, let's do something about it. Uh, and so it was a very effective way to get them to really get engaged and really come up with measures that can work. So now we're working with the same fishermen to come up with different 
area closures and fishing bans and different management measures to recover these stocks. So that's what you can do in a small space like Palau. The other case is in Indonesia, which is a country that's married to people with people on the Southern Island. Uh, big fisheries, obviously we're not going to get all the fishermen together and start catching fish by hand. So we started working on a fishery, it's the deep water supply fishery. It um, takes place in the border between Australia and Indonesia, where Timor Leste is, on that area. It's not our near shore fishery, it's a deep water fishery. And when we started working with this fishery, they told us they were around 30 species that they caught. Um, we didn't really know much about it, um, we or the processor of the buyers. But we partnered with two companies. One is Norpac Fishing Export, this is a North American company in a joint venture with a Chinese company called um, Good Time Fishing Venture. And they buy uh, fish in Indonesia and they export it to the US. And then we also partnered with a processor who processes the fish to Norpac there. And that's their plan is called PT Pretty More Time. Uh, and we were trying to find ways in which we could um, work with and start collecting data to figure out <coughs> what is the condition of these, these fisheries in the stock. I'm going to show you some photos for you to get a sense of the fishery and the size. So this is a, a mid-scale fishery, these are the boats. Um, this is the bring the boats. I don't know why they put them in plastic bags, but they wrap it, each fish in a plastic bag and then they get put and they throw the bags in the ocean. So now we have a recycling program to get them not to throw the bags in the ocean. <laughs> it's, it's a little surprising. So uh, they're in the hole, they're in ice, and then they get downloaded. Yeah, they get landed here on the port. The operation is to get the land in the um, and, and then inside the fishing plant, they, they start sorting out the fish by species, and they start cleaning the fish, and grading the fish, and processing the fish. And so once we started working with uh, this company, we we were told there were about 30 species. And so we hired a bunch of scientists and we started these samplings and turns out there are more than 100 species of fish. And then we were selling a lot of snapper that is not really snapper. Um, we've also been using um, electronic tracking devices. We use a thing called Spot Tracer. It's really an anti step device. It's not really meant to track boats, but to track anything you don't want. And it's actually quite cheap, and we can put it in boats. And the captains actually don't mind having it because captains have crew, and they want to know if their crew are fishing, so they're delighted to have spot in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> the crew is not that happy, but um, so we got a sense of where they're going, who's fishing in that water, uh, and then we develop a fishing guide. Go back to all about that idea. It's just that thing there of each species. Uh, with all their information, and each species has a barcode system. And then the fishermen, the processing plant employees can scan. We've, worked, we've trained the plant employees on fish identification and the scanning methods, and then we're, we've built a computer system that can start processing data automatically, so we can start collecting and do stock assessment. And in order to measure the fish fast when you're processing a lot of fish that spoils. It has to be a system that doesn't delay processing, that is not complicated, and that can really be accurate. So we invented a machine, and I'm going to show you a little video, I'm going to start to explain, that allows you to measure the fish that are coming in the processing plant. So here's the video, let me see. So you're going to see, they're going to uh, basically, what happens is the fish are landed, they're sorted and graded into boxes, and then each box um, gets scanned. So she gives her this, the scan, she scans the, the box. And so all these fish are the same species, and then they start measuring the fish. And so it's a scanner and a measuring board. You take the scanner, you measure the length of the fish, and it gets reported automatically into the computer. And they're doing that really slow. In reality, they're five fish at a time and they go really fast. <coughs> but we've done tests and it's actually quite accurate. It's only you only uh, are off by like, like three centimeters. So what we can do with this data is you start seeing where is most of your fish 
where does it fall? Each species has a, a length, a maturity, and an optimal length. And so if you start seeing that all your fish are down on this side of the curve, all your fish are juvenile, so you're obviously being overfishing your stock. Instead, if you're fishing and all your fish are mature in the right length, you're probably fishing your stock okay. So this is what this is allowing us to do, and this also goes to the processor and to the exporter, because Norpac is an exporting company that has commitments with U.S. supermarkets that are committed to uh, sustainable sourcing, they have to show that they're fishing sustainably. So this is helping them do that. And then all this information gets into the phase and they go with the label. And so eventually you will be able to track and, and as a consumer, you'll be able to see, oh, okay, well, this came from the Indonesia, this came from this company, this snapper, and that's the goal to get there. Um, so that's that's in the meeting. <laughs> and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about a different type of project that we've been engaged in for the past 10 years in one of our oldest fisheries projects, which is a little bit different. It's not necessarily about assessing the stock and trying to find out what's going on. Um, this is in the West Coast in California in the West Coast Groundfish Fishery. This is a fishery that goes up and down the West Coast of the US. Uh, it's about 80 species in this fishery, all of them bottom-blowing species, and it's a mix. There's some flatfish, a lot of rock, and there's black cod or sable fish um, gets caught together or excuse me, get caught together. And the, the main fishing uh, gear is a trawl, it's a bottom trawl. So this fishery was very profitable in the 80s and 90s, uh, and then it started collapsing. A lot of the habitat was destroyed because of the trawlers. Uh, a lot of the rockfish started declining. And the U.S. government, federal and federal land species, are putting in regulations. It became a lot of burden on regulation, very costly to the fishermen. And then in 2000, it was declared a federal fishery disaster. And it was pretty much a lot of the processors closed up and left. And a lot of the fishermen were pretty desperate. And they, you know, they're stuck with a trawler, you can't sell it, you can't catch fish, it's expensive. Um, so when we then was in around 2000, and we started working with the fishermen and with other groups and the regulatory agencies to try and convince them and set aside some areas for no troll zones, so areas where you couldn't troll. Um, and this was a process, and we ended up petitioning the Pacific Council for a set aside of 3.8 million acres of no troll zones. And some of the fishermen who helped us throughout this process said, you know, that's fine, but you're putting us out of business. <coughs> And so the nature conservancy said, fine, we'll buy you out, and we'll buy your permits, and you know, at least you don't lose that. You get some money. And so some of them said yes, and we ended up buying, not all of them at once, but we ended up buying 13 permits out of 23 permits. So we ended up being one, a very large asset holder in this fishery. And as an as a NGO, we don't tend to have a seat at the table with fishermen, so now we work. And I, th I think the belief by the fishermen and by many was that we would shell the permits and we wouldn't use them. So we wouldn't fish. But we felt that we're asking fishermen to change their practices and demonstrate that they can fish sustainably and make a living. We should demonstrate that it can be done. So we said to change the business model in that fishery. Um, so the old business model was it was a high volume fishery with low value. You know, you troll fish for four hours in the net, it's not very good place to come out of it. And we wanted to change it to a vol low volume, low volume high value fishery with certain conservation restrictions on how the fishing takes place. In 2011, uh, the West Coast Roundfish Fishery switched to a catch year system. And for those who don't know their catch year system, it's a regular type of system where each fisherman has a quota allocated to them based on their catch history. And so the fishermen don't have to raise for fish, right? It's a much better way to fish. And, um, and so what happened is there are some species, um, like the silver sole, where it is very abundant. So you get tend to get a, a large quota for that. 
But there are other species like the yellow eye rockfish, which are not very abundant. And so the quota is very limited. So here's the total level catch for the, rock, uh, the yellow eye rockfish, and it's only 1,300 pounds for the fishery, whereas it's, you know, 49 million pounds for the silver soul. So in 2011, if you're a fisherman and you have very little rock eye, yellow uh, rock eye fish, <laughs> yellow eye rock fish, <laughs> now I'm calling canary rock fish, um, it's very risky to go fishing. Because if you go fishing and you put down a toe and you pull it up and suddenly you have two kilos of quota and you have four kilos of rock fish, to land the, the, foot, the fish you have to buy quota. And nobody wants to sell you their quota because they're sold in. And if you don't have quota, you can't land your fish and then you're closer for business. So it's a very risky thing to go fishing for them. So when it first started, it was, I think for a few months, nobody went fishing, but it was way. Um, <laughs> and with the Nature's Conservancy permits, we also got a pretty big allocation of overfish species quota. And I think it was just 27 that we bought the permit that had a lot of that quota. So we became, um, pretty wealthy in quota for all fish species, and we were trying to find a way to reduce risk to fishermen, including ourselves. And, and we created, and we copied this from the insurance company. So we figured out, we'll pull all our quota together and invite fishermen to join the, the risk pool. And if you're one in our risk pool, and you go out and have a bad day, you can take quota from the pool to cover your landings. Um, but you do have to fish by our rules. Our rules are to have spatial fisheries management plans, observers on board, um, gear switching and zoning restrictions, and also we developed an app called eCatch that allows you to track everything you're doing on an iPad, and this was fun because when we first did this, and we gave iPad to the fishermen, you should have seen their looks. They were like, <laughs> What am I going to do with this? <laughs> and we were convinced they were going to throw the iPads and work <laughs> They came back the next day and they had to throw it over the room. And then after a while, they're like, you know, it's actually useful. And so I, one of the fishermen that worked with us, he was at a presentation recently and he said, Carmen, I don't go fishing anymore. I go out and collect data. It's a tool of transformation. But what they discovered is um, so the idea is we have these fishing associations that we help and, and they form and they they're all part of the risk pool. And they all fish together and compare the data. So we have these fishing spatial fishing management plans. And so if one of them goes out and puts out um, a hook and line and gets a lot of rock fish immediately sends a notice to the other say, hey, this is a bad area, and avoid this area. So there's, they've discovered that collectively and sharing information is something fishermen don't get to do. So they can fish better. They can find places they want to set aside the control zones. They can also you know, save on gas and things like that. So it's been a very, very um, successful model that is also being replicated in other parts of the coast. Uh, and also it's helped them demonstrate that they are fishing very sustainably. Um, they would like to get a market access for that and really get more price for the fish and, and special uh, access to special markets that right now they don't have. Uh, so for them, it's really worked. It's, 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 the value of these permits has increased. And just to show you the difference on, on the quota use is the risk pool is only using 2% of the available quota whereas the rest of the fleet is using 35% for these overfish species. So it really shows that you can really manage it well and avoid a lot of these overfish species. Um, so this has been a very successful project. Right now we're working with the community, um, community organizations to try and figure out how to market their fish so that they have a financial impact in place. Um, and we gave all our data and the fishermen's data to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, they have a seafood watch card, and the West Coast brown fish fishery appears as red. And when they did the analysis with the data and the risk pool, it was green. And so now we're trying to work with them, with the fishermen, to see if they can 
uh, they should be some reward for them doing the right thing, and they should be able to get into the better market and get them um, better prices for their place. So, so this is a, a very fun and long uh, project, but it's been very successful in doing similar things also in Spain and also in Maine. Um, and that's what I have. Thank you. Or, 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 or
is not a problem. I'm wondering how, what the experience has been with the second part of the low volume, high value equation, with the with the getting better value for the for the larger uh, sizes in these three fisheries or in any other. Yeah, they were getting much better value. So the the black cod, which is the one they fish the most, was going whatever two dollars a pound. All this one something a pound. You get you get a really long main fillet to the hook and line, but you want getting to the trawl. I think the the challenge is the you know fish prices are fluctuating a lot depending on the land you live in or how you get supported from other countries. So what the fishermen are not concerned about is that they really need that market access edge. They 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 don't want to be labeled as a boy because the whole West Coast ground is they can show their green, they can show their green spatially. So if they could get you know guaranteed access to a certain market, not as much the price premium as that market access and containing market presence that is almost more valuable to them. So their perception was that the sustainability was having uh, an impact on market on, on market access more so than the size. Yeah, yeah, no, the, and definitely in the US and Europe, other places than China now. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S. and Europe, market access and sustaining that market um, for your fishery or your products is very important uh, because mm -hmm. more and more commitments are being made to sustain the policy. And so it's almost hard to get into Costco or Whole Foods or anywhere else unless you can show it. And so the fishermen that work with us in Bristol can really show it in spatial data and maps. And what they're frustrated <coughs> is that just because they're not in the sea doesn't mean it. So the alternative is a fishing improvement project or on a right day aquarium. So finding those other avenues that you don't have to go through the whole certification stewardship <coughs> council, which is very expensive. And our fishermen would never be able to qualify for the fishing council because that's the entire fishery that would be a good position, and it's not. So that that those are part of the challenges that we are managing these huge areas as a single fishery when I'm uh, sorry, I was late, so I don't know if you can touch the area of European cost as well as you know the Atlantic Ocean and North Sea and so on. And the other question is what the TNC represents. Is that a federal or government sponsor or is a private company? The Nature Conservancy is a non governmental organization, so they're a conservation organization. Uh, we get most of our funding from private donors. Uh, some government Um, we don't work in Europe. We don't have projects in Europe. We have offices in Europe, but we mostly support policy and fishing. But um, my new my new boss is Maria Damanaki, who's the <laughs> former EU Fisheries Commissioner. So I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. We might work in Europe next year. Um, but so the has a very strong with the fisheries. They really have been doing a good job for at least ten or fifteen years. Some books and all that, but at least they had their focus and the problem so like them. But we don't we don't have any field program in Europe. Nice to meet you. someone in the background. Yeah, so in the California Grand Fishery, what percentage of the fishers are in the risk pool and how does that level out or is it still an increase depending? What are you doing to get the rest of the fishers involved? Been increasing. They're, they're not all in our risk pool, but there are some other similar risk pools that have been creeping up and down the coast. So right now, we are working with four different community fishing associations. We, what we're calling them community Buddha funds because they come together and create their own organization. Um, but I know that up in Waco, Washington, some parts of Washington and Argo, there are others that have started something similar. Um, so. We hope that this can be replicated not by us, but just by fishermen. Um, and, it, and we do see a trend increase. Kind of really simple question. With the, the slide that you showed uh, on trap stocks, and you defined those on trap stocks, is that information based on? Yeah, it's, um, 
the paper that Chris was developing is paper being from the Santa Barbara Academy, and it's all based on the most combination of hatch savers from all of them. But it's the only information that they could see. But I think it's pretty good. They have quite a lot of pictures in that data that's not included by the study. So there are a reason why that's not selected as one of the sites. No, our <coughs> mostly because we were looking at top country, country countries and actually went further down the list, but also because capacity was our program in Mexico doesn't have enough capacity. Uh, so, and they're busy with other things. <laughs> but yes, so then we have to Do you think you'll be entering other fisheries as permit holders or permit consolidators? Are there other fisheries that you're thinking of? Yeah, I can imagine. Um, we are, we do have a couple permits in Maine. We are considering adding more permits in developing Maine, but the price of the permits are still high for what they could be worth. Uh, I think we're also looking at Massachusetts, which is a all around me. Um, I don't think we'll be buying permits. Um, Outside of the year, um, but you never know. Um, because, well, you know, they don't come with a quota allocation, so it's um, So, yeah, it's expensive to do it that way. Um, so, we would rather find a way to submit it. So, maybe not you, but maybe other people who are We, I think we were involved with Rapita early on, but not now. I think EDF. Scott used to run the Mexico program for EDF. He'll probably tell you more about Rapita than I can. <laughs> so you mentioned that. Um, a lot of the fishermen you're working with, uh, in order to get access to to better markets, they would need some sort of certification like MSC, but they can't because of the current standards they're required to meet at, as a fishery at the fishery level. Um, and then you mentioned Monterey Bay. TNC has a lot of clout. Do you think TNC is well positioned to actually kind of, um, I guess, broker a sort of like other certification program through the MSC or something like that? Or do you think the best kind of uh, path to access to better markets would be through Monterey Bay or some other certification program entirely? I think, I mean, we've talked about it internally because we wanted to figure out how to accelerate uh, path to certification for a lot of small scale fisheries. Um, we don't see ourselves as opt-in auditors or even certifiers. Um, but we do, we, we are working with the Marine Stewardship Council to try and find a path for what they call fisheries in transition. So fisheries in the developing world that will never have a perfect job assessment. So what are the vehicles and what are the benchmarking tools that they can use to get there? So we are working with them on that and providing them access to tools. Um, we're also trying to work with what they're called the fishery improvement projects. There are a lot of fishery improvement projects out there. Some of Run by the Water Fund, some of them run by the Fisheries Partnership, some of them run by EDF, some of them run by TNC. And there's a whole range. Some of them are really good, and some of them are just greenwashing. Some of them are run by industry as well. And so we are involved with quite a few of these fishery improvement projects. And I think the idea that this, the, the retailers are now getting a little suspicious that some of the fisheries improvement projects that they're selling as typical source is not quite fair. And the Marine Stewardship Council and of course the people that have gone through full certification are really annoyed that their market share is getting by people who are just really watching. So there is a talk between the SIPs and the MSC to try and find a common way of to grade these fisheries improvement projects. And we're definitely helping on that as well. But I don't think we'll ever be the one to Fernandez from the Junction of Ultra Lines, and my question is on the fishing. Um, recently, 
author was cited to the Thank you so much. 